So what are the different operations that are available? There are a number of different operations available and variations in the way that they're done. Uh, bariatric surgery is a constantly evolving practice and over the years that uh, it's been done, 30 or 40 years, um, many different operations have been designed, they've been tested, they've been evaluated and in many cases they've been abandoned. But currently and in Australia there are three main types of operations done. Uh, the adjustable gastric band, uh, the sleeve gastrectomy and various forms of bypasses and each of them have advantages and disadvantages but overall uh, although the adjustable gastric band was immensely popular in the 10 years from 2010, 2000 to 2010, uh, it's largely been abandoned and uh, the rates now are only about 12% of bariatric operations around Australia are banned, about 76% is sleeve and a small percentage uh, are the bypasses. This unit has concentrated on the sleeve uh, really for the last 10 years since I started doing it 14 years ago. Doctor, why don't you favour the bypass? Look, the bypass operations, particularly uh, the traditional Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, has been a workhorse of bariatric surgery around the world for 30 years, and there's no doubt it is a good operation. But um, in America and in Australia, what we're seeing is that more people are changing from the bypass as their primary operation to the sleeve gastrectomy. And I, I rather view the bypasses, and I used to do them uh, when I started surgery, I rather view the bypasses as a little bit like bringing a bazooka to a gunfight when a Colt 45 is going to do the job. There's no doubt it's a very powerful operation, but you've got to expect some collateral damage. And the bypasses bring in an element of malabsorption, particularly to nutrients like iron and calcium, which the sleeve does not do. With a sleeve, what you eat is what you get. And down the track, if patients aren't taking their multivitamins assiduously, they will get deficient, and that's a problem. Also, there are some particular longer-term complications from the bypass, like ulcers at the join and, and obstruction of the bowel, that at times can be life-threatening. And But the, the main reason why I don't favour the bypass is rule number one, which is that all obesity surgery will eventually fail to some degree. And the problem with the bypass is that when people start to regain weight with a bypass five, ten years down the track, there really is no effective, safe, easy revision option uh, to make that pouch smaller. Mm. And uh, although there have been lots of things tried, they're just not uniformly successful in the way they are with the sleeve. So with the sleeve, as I've said, you can re-sleeve, you can convert it to a bypass. So you've got lots of revision options. And uh, so for us, we reserve uh, bypass surgery for some uh, unusual circumstances and particularly where circumstances where the sleeve is just not appropriate. Doctor, what if a uh, patient doesn't have private insurance? Well, um, the bariatric surgery in the public centre at the moment is very limited. So Joondalup Hospital uh, has a modest bariatric program and I think they're allowed to do two or three hundred cases a year. Um, a lot of their caseload uh, is swamped by patients who've previously had bands and have had complications of the bands and they're trying to then fix those problems up. In practical terms, you're probably going to wait two or three years just to be seen in one of their clinics and another period of waiting a year or two just to get on their waiting list. So if patients don't carry private insurance, we recommend a number of things. The first is take out private insurance, wait a year, and then you'll be ready to have your surgery. The second is that it is actually possible to access your superannuation account if you have monies uh, in that account, sufficient monies, uh, which can pay for the whole surgery yeah. or for the gap, um, which is for us around six to $7,000 on top of any private insurance that you have. Why do you favour the sleeve? Um, I've been doing the sleeve for 14 years and over that time there is nothing I've seen about it that hasn't 
firmed up my view that the sleeve is a fantastic operation. Uh, it is well tolerated by patients. It's durable. The quality of eating, the quality of eating, and the absence of long-term side effects, I believe, are superior to any of the other operations. How does the sleeve work? Um, so I like to think of the sleeve um, as a reductive operation rather than a restrictive operation, which is what the band is, mm -hmm. or a malabsorptive operation, which is what the bypasses uh, deliver as well. Um, and by re reductive, I mean that, and I've got a model I can show this. So this is about the size and shape of a typical stomach. By reductive, I mean that by keyhole surgery, laparoscopic surgery, uh, we can staple off and permanently remove about 90% of the stomach. And that converts you from what is typically a one and a half litre st stomach sac to about a 100 mil stomach tube. So your stomach is going to start off looking a little bit like that in shape and size. The outlet of your now skinny stomach is still the normal pyloric valve or sphincter that opens and closes rhythmically. And that means that unlike a band, which is a ring that sits around the top part of the stomach and produces a restriction to flow, this is a dynamic system. It opens and closes. And that means that unlike a band, patients are able to tolerate all the foods which a band patient so struggles it works with. Like normal, normal, yeah. it, it is much more physiological. So they're better able to tolerate things like uh, sandwiches, bread, chicken and steak, all the foods that the band patients typically struggle with. A sleeve patient is able to eat. But here's the beauty of it, in a much smaller amount. And typically that will be an entree size portion and that entree will feel like a banquet. But the sleeve does a lot more than reduce the amount that a person can eat at one time. Because you now have a much smaller volume stomach, there's actually an absolute volume reduction even to liquids. And so patients get to half a mug of coffee to begin with and they feel full. And the coffee is getting cool by the time they finish. Unlike a band patient who, for whom there is very little restriction to flow of fluids and so because they can't eat good quality solids, they slip into bad behaviour and they drink the high calorie liquids mm. because they can and they end up gaining weight or not losing as much. The other way in which the sleeve works, which is very different to the band and the bypass, is that by removing this much stomach, we get rid of a lot of the area of the stomach that makes a particular hunger hormone called ghrelin. And so patients after a sleeve almost universally report and experience that they just don't feel hungry like they used to. They'll often say to me, I have to remind myself to eat. And they're not being driven by the same constant hunger and appetite that characterised their life beforehand. Now, ghrelin is still made from this part of the stomach, which is retained, but in much smaller amounts. And the levels only rise very slowly over months and years after surgery. And patients generally don't return to that same drive of hunger as they used to have. There are some other ways in which the sleeve works. And so, for example, because you now have a very small volume stomach, it actually empties more rapidly than a normal stomach. There's no time for the food to get diluted uh, and to be released slowly. Okay. And that has a consequence. So if, for example, you choose the wrong food, particularly very sweet foods like chocolate lollies and uh, milkshake, those high calorie carbohydrates hits the small bowel in a rush. The small bowel doesn't like that. It wants to draw water in to dilute those things out your blood sugar might go very high and then plummet very low. And about 20 minutes after you have a row of chocolate, patients will often experience something called diarrhea and dumping, where they feel shivery and shaky and sweaty and they have a fast pulse rate and they may end up with the runs and with cramp. And they very quickly learn not to do that. So patients that used to have a sweet tooth say to me, I used to enjoy chocolate, now I can't stand it. The same thing happens with alcohol to an extent too. And so not only aren't you able to drink 
the same volume of alcohol, but the alcohol passes through very quickly, it gets absorbed very quickly, and you will get twice as drunk twice as quickly on the same amount of alcohol. Now, of course, that has an implication for people who are driving, whereas before they may have had four or five drinks in a night and been fine, they can be over the limit with two or three drinks. It's interesting, isn't it? Also, the beer would have a lot of sugar in it as well. Wouldn't that spike it? Yes, it does. But also, you know, if you try and drink fizzy drinks like beer and champagne, you're just going to bubble up and burp. Yeah. So they have to go back to sipping on Chardonnay. <laughs>